there. All right. Anyway, there's a lot of news. So this one I thought was interesting. Um, more than half of Americans really don't have a problem with law enforcement using face recognition. Uh, the cops have it. It's in the airport. They want to, you know, they use it to capture criminals and terrorists and stuff. And most people feel like the cops will probably use it responsibly. What they don't believe is that tech companies or advertisers will use it responsibly, which I must say, I tend to agree with that. And yet, there are restrictions in what the federal government can get, and there's apparently no restrictions on what advertising and tech companies can get. But I think they're absolutely right. The cops will mostly use it just to catch crooks. But you know these other companies will do something awful with it. Anyway, um, so I, you asked about a year ago, they banned Kaspersky after the shadow brokers dump. As part of, I mean, yes, it was two years ago. It was part of the 2016 election as part of the Russians' campaign to make sure that Donald Trump won the election. They tried to embarrass the government by leaking NSA secrets, and they tried to pretend it was a Romanian hacker, and it all was exposed. But anyway, is there, they, they did see the NSA data by means of Kaspersky antivirus. And so U.S. federal government systems were ordered to stop using Kaspersky, and apparently this is now made a permanent rule officially. So this is bad news for Kaspersky. They yelled a lot about it, but there seems to be no turning it back. That and Huawei, they just seem to be hosed, kicked out of the American market, and not likely to come back anytime soon. <coughs> Civilians can use it, but no company would use it if they want to do business with the government. The same thing when the government won't use something here, very few people can continue to use it. This is why you know, we, we, we like to brag about how the government doesn't dominate companies here the way it does in other countries. Maybe not quite as much, but still quite a lot. Um, so Firefox, I've heard they're going to add a Tor extension inside Firefox, and now they're going to add a Cloudflare VPN option inside Firefox. So you can have some sort of built-in VPN that gets you to the nearest Cloudflare. So it's um, uh, VPNs are, of course, not perfect. That just means your data goes to some VPN server, and at that server, it might be logged or inspected or passed on unencrypted or something. But um, they, uh, it is a lot better than no average layer of security at all. It means that none of the people near you in your coffee house can steal the data. And some of the people, there's no layer of encryption. So that sounds like a good idea. Um, Gidra, they're now putting out a Gidra decompiler to go into Ida Pro. Gidra already has a decompiler inside Gidra itself, but now they're putting an Ida Pro compiler out, which I think this is bad news for the people that make Ida Pro because they're selling their decompilers for like $5,000. So the NSA dumping out a free alternative is probably a little rough on them, but it's good for all of us who would like a decompiler. So um, I will see if I can get this working for the malware analysis class. You can apparently get right back to C source code inside Ida, which is interesting. I do have a simple project there where you get one program back to its source code inside Gidra. Um, and it, Gidra can do much, much more. There's whole classes at like Black Hat and stuff in Gidra. And there's books out and everything. It's one of the things I might add to my classes more, especially now that I'm getting some help writing projects. I might be able to cover more of these exciting new things. I just haven't had time to do enough research on. Um, yeah? Yeah. Oh, no, I did. Other people didn't. Everybody else said, oh, the NSA put it on. It must have a secret backdoor and it's spying on you and stuff. And I said, oh, I really don't think so. And a bunch of people found that it was like making network connections and they freaked out. But ultimately, nothing came of that. I think a bunch of people were afraid of that and they didn't find it. I was not particularly afraid of that. But yeah. Anyway, so D-Link, these networks have a password file with your password in plain text that's shared over the network with no authentication. So that's good, clean fun. You can just open a file and you'll find your password in there. So that's pretty rude and I imagine they patched that. <laughs> Actually, this might be the one. Yeah, they tried to get D-Link. They told them and they, they ignored the vulnerability reports and said they said they're going public. Then they uh, issued a bunch of confusing nonsense and then they just stopped answering questions. So they didn't actually patch it or anything. <laughs> This is what you usually get. This is what I get. Like, they went in this conference in Sri Lanka. They told me, list all the major vulnerabilities you found and what happened. I said, well, there's hundreds of them, but almost always what happens is nobody cares. They completely ignore me and they don't fix it. <laughs> um, anyway, so this is interesting. I, I, there's one, a different article at Proton Mail. Proton Mail is adding a bunch of new encryption features to try to increase the accuracy with which all the email is encrypted. But I, there's a second thing. And this I find actually very interesting. I did a lot of research into Android apps because they are spectacularly insecure 
and I'm using Android apps from the Google Play Store, which is the number one source. Now, another thing I noticed in passing, but I didn't do much of a study of, is that the Amazon App Store is appalling. All the apps there are like two years or more out of date. They don't keep it up to date. So I thought that'll be handy. If they ever were to patch any of the vulnerabilities I find in the Google Play Store, I can just send students to the Amazon Store to get the old version of the app. But there's apparently a Huawei Play Store, which I did not know. In fact, I wish I had known this when I tried to teach an Android class in China because the students couldn't get to Google Play and they couldn't get the apps. If I could get to the Huawei store, they might have been able to get their apps. I don't know if you can get the Huawei store outside China, but anyway, there are three sources of Android apps, which I didn't know. Google Play, Amazon, and Huawei. So, and people are saying the Huawei store, and they're talking about why is ProtonMail supporting the Huawei store. And anyway, obviously, if you want people in China to use it, you'd have to put it in the Huawei store. But I would expect Google Play store is all full of malware. I would imagine the Huawei store to be even worse, and therefore more interesting for me. Probably find more exciting vulnerabilities in those apps. So if I get back to doing Android security audits again, I might do that. Um, Microsoft, this just came out today. They said everybody using Active Directory should read this. Uh, Microsoft uses lightweight directory access protocol when you log into a domain controller. And um, it is there are some attacks on it as it goes over the network. And apparently they are now uh, doing more network layer security, signing and some kind of binding. Uh, this is like network authentication, which Microsoft has had for a while, to limit who's allowed to connect so that third parties can't mess with it as much. And so I don't quite know how it works, but they say this is coming out. It's going to be the new hotness in Windows Active Directories. So people that are going to run Active Directory domains should get used to this stuff. This is probably going to be an option and then enforced as you go forward. Another layer of security. So uh, I know Microsoft uh, domain controller security is very complicated. Yeah. What's that? I can't understand you. I found the Huawei App Store. You found the Huawei App Store? Oh, good. You can get the Huawei. Good. Can the Huawei? Yeah, let's see. The Huawei App Store. Yeah, is it? Uh, it's, it's in China. I wondered about that. Well, you know, there is a translator, supposedly. I know. Well, you know, one thing I need is I need some Chinese partners. I need someone who can set up. I own just three projects in Huawei to take to China. And I need someone who speaks Chinese and probably has like Chinese credit card to set these things up. Anyway. Um, it's, um, I would like to have Chinese versions of my stuff that can run in China, and they will have to use the Huawei properties instead of the Google properties. Anyway, um, yeah. So I'll, um, I'd have to outsource that to someone that's good at Chinese, but I'm interested in doing security audits and stuff in the Huawei store. Um, so uh, California has passed a law saying that companies in the gig economy like Uber are going to have to tr to regard their uh, – their drivers as employees instead of treating them as independent contractors and denying them benefits. And so Google, I mean, Uber has already responded that they are not going to do it because the drivers are not essential to their business. And that sounds like that's going to be hard to explain in court. <laughs> oh, we don't need the drivers. We could be fine without them. I, I'm not quite sure how that works, <laughs> but that is their current position that drivers are not essential to their business and therefore they're not employees. So uh, I don't know, unless they've got self-driving cars that work a little better than I think, I think drivers are essential to their business, but I guess this is going to court. Yeah. Well, of course, of course. And that's the whole point of the gig economy. And that's why many people like my sister is very down in the gig economy. I think Alexandra ocasio Cortez and Elizabeth Warren are. And a lot of people say the gig economy is terrible because you don't make living wage and you don't get benefits and they really should go back to the old system where you have a full-time job and you have a union and you have benefits and all that jazz. Um, yeah. Anyway. Um, so, so you can put malware in a virtual hard disk file, a VHD, which you certainly can. And apparently antivirus doesn't catch it in there when you move it over the network. It would catch it if you put it in a zip file, I think, but apparently not in a VHD, a virtual hard disk. But when you mount the disk and try to run the files, then it will catch you. So I'm not sure exactly how much this matters. But anyway, it is an issue. And I did some things. Uh, I've done some research, and we're doing some in the malware analysis class where we talk about ways to sneak malicious things past antivirus. So that's another possible technique. Uh, Trump wants us to have lower interest rates and even negative rates, which apparently is elsewhere. I don't understand how you can have a negative interest rate at all. And the people that really don't like this are retirees that are trying to live off their investments because, of course, the federal government rate determines everything. There's a chart down here. Of it. I guess it's not going to load here. Yeah, this is the rate. It, of course, the real interest rate you get on your money 
is the blue line and it follows the federal rate. So if the federal rate gets low, then the rewards on all your savings gets low and it's hard for retired people to live. Yeah. Yeah, Japan has negative. Various people do have negative rates. Um, from a mathematical point of view, this offends me. This sounds insane, like dividing by zero. But anyway, it does apparently happen and Trump wants to do it here because he wants the economy to go up so he can get reelected. Nixon did that too. Yeah, well. Um, oh, if he, if, he let, if he stops the trade war, then it will go up. And that, well, more trade wars would push it down, but all he has to do is forgive China about eight months before the election. And then the economy will go up. So that's, anyway, now this one, I don't know if these guys are nuts or what. Trump, after Trump ended the treaty with, Trump ended the nuclear deal with Iran and so that they couldn't have their assets. And now he's talking about letting the French give them a pile of money so in order to get them to recomply with the nuclear deal, which they're now violating. So I don't know if this is madness or what. Of course, it could very well be what Trump said and still be madness. But anyway, um, we'll see what happens here. It was, uh, it's, it's sort of weird out there. <laughs> uh, she really has no shame. And here's another one that really makes no sense. I mean, London financial world is in total turmoil because of Brexit and Hong Kong is in bloody turmoil. They don't even know if they're going to like have a riot and insurgency and an invasion from China. So I don't know. I mean, they want to buy the London stock exchange. It seems like six or one and half a dozen of the other to me. I don't think either of them should be regarded as a stable center of finance right now. But anyway, well, yes, but I think they have to get their house in order first. <laughs> and I think you'd say the same thing for London. Well, that's true. Now, but they, if China just took over and they stopped the fighting, that would be stability again, sort of. Anyway, um, anyway, so I think I'll, uh, all right. So let me get on to the official stuff here. We're, uh, we're up to the official time. So I want to talk about format strings, and this is pretty much all just a demonstration of it with a few concepts. Uh, this is, like buffer overflows, another piece of madness brought to you by C. This one is even more incomprehensible. Why anybody would write a language like this? But they did. So format strings are used in C, and they're used in many languages, and there's nothing in principle wrong with format strings, although it gets to the heart of why all these exploits happen. The fundamental weakness that we are exploiting is that computers do not have context. They do not know what a byte means. That byte could be an integer, part of an instruction, part of an address, an executable command, part of a movie, or a text. It could be anything. The same byte is used for all these different meanings, so all of these exploits involve loading up bytes in one context and then interpreting them in another context where they mean something different. So that's the fundamental problem. And so this means in a simple way, if you just want to print something, you don't know how to print it. You don't know whether you should print it as uh, operation, a hexadecimal binary or what you want. So when you print something, you can print integers with percent D or you can print string characters with percent C or strings with percent S or pointers with percent P or percent X for hexadecimal. And the same thing can be printed in any of these formats. It's just a byte. It can be printed any way you want. Um, all right, but then you can do this crazy thing. You can print something with no format string at all, and then it will just make a default format. But then you can do this, which in a more sensible language would fail. You can print a bunch of format strings with no actual variable here. So you tell it, print three things in hexadecimal, but you don't tell it what to print. Now, remember we talked about this in assembly code. The way this looks in assembly code is you'll push the arguments, the things to print on the stack, then you'll push the format string on the stack, then you'll call printf, it will then take the first thing on the stack, interpret it as the format string, and the rest will be the variables. So it will just print random junk here, which is whatever happened to be on the stack, which was not what the developer put there. Now, other languages would call this an error. You forgot to specify what I'm printing. But C will just do it, and so now you're printing out stuff that is not really under your control. And that's the fundamental weakness of format strings. So here's the ones that matter most to us, just hexadecimal, and you can put a number in front of it and make it a longer number of characters, which will turn out to be very important later. So here's format strings vulnerabilities. Now, like I say, this is another example, the one we've done before, buffer overflows, I can make room for 10 characters and then I can put in more than 10 characters and C just does it because it's like an amnesiac. It does one command and when it goes to the next command, it has forgotten about the previous one completely and it no longer remembers that this doesn't make any sense. So that's the game. 
And so you can this thing, which makes no sense, will in fact run just fine because the printf subroutine will just print whatever's on the stack and there will be some random junk on the stack. It will not fail because there's nothing you're not allowed to print. So it's not possible for whatever's on the stack to be invalid or illegal or anything, or at least it's not likely, although it could point to an unavailable address. That's the only way it could be wrong. But anyway, yeah. So what's the argument? The arguments are the variables here. You're supposed to print variables like i, j, and k. If you don't specify them, it will just look on the stack. And if it finds anything there that can be printed, it will print it. Now, if it finds something up there like a bunch of capital A's making an address that's invalid, then it will actually give you an error message. We'll see that. Anyway, so we can make one here and I've got it running on my cloud machine, which is here. Okay, so here's my cloud machine. Let me go into 127 and chapter four and... All right, um, so let's cat ed. Okay, so here's the main one we're going to play with today. I got a couple libraries and I've got a buffer, and then I'm just going to take the argv1, which came from the command line, and put it in the buffer, and then I'm going to print the buffer without specifying the format string. That's all I do. So, by the way, there's a buffer overflow here. If you were to put in a format, a command, a command line argument was longer than 1,024 characters, you should have an overflow, but I don't care about that. We're going to exploit this one command. That one command can lead to total takeover of the machine. So if you run this, and then you give it a um, simple message like hello, it will just echo back hello. It prints whatever you give it, it, runs, it prints it for you. But if you give it um, like percent %x, oops, I hit it. I'm getting losing control of my computer. All right, percent %x. Then it prints a random variable it found on the stack. And you can have as many of them as you want and put dots between them just so you can tell them apart. So now I'm getting data from the stack, which the developer did not control or intend for me to see. So now I have an information disclosure vulnerability. I can see data which I was not expected to see. So I might be able to find secret information of some sort up there, the address of memory, important memory locations, or stored passwords or something. So that's one kind of vulnerability. Um, I also have a denial of service vulnerability. If I use this weird thing called percent %n, I'll put in a few percent %n's, then I'll get a segmentation fault. So we gotta talk about what percent %n is. Percent %n is one of the more screwy things about C. Um, Percent %x just prints the value of a variable on the stack in hexadecimal. Percent %n takes the value on the stack, interprets it as an address, and writes to that address. Now, I have no idea why they would give you a print command that can print two arbitrary locations in memory. That just seems to be only useful for hackers to take over the machine. I have no idea what conceivable value this had to any kind of legitimate developer, but for some Amazing reason, it is actually valid C to use the percent %n variable. So now, instead of printing this number, FF9FE, it will print to that location in RAM. And then this one, and then that one. And when it gets to the fourth one, it's printing to this crazy address 25, probably this 808 causes it to crash, because that's in the text segment, and the text segment is not readable. In modern operating systems, it's write or execute. You can either write, make something writable or executable. This is the writable area, this is the stack. So it's okay to write there, but this is the code section, 804, and you aren't allowed to write there, so the third one will cause a crash. Yeah. Uh, randomization enabled, it would probably still work. The location, because these addresses, this is another problem. This is, by the way, this kind of information disclosure will typically undo address-based layout randomization because these addresses here point to locations on the stack and locations in the text segment as part of the program operation. And when it randomizes, if I have an information disclosure vulnerability, I can see those addresses. So that's one problem with information disclosure. It'll typically undo ASLR because you can look up an address and that tells you where the code is. Yeah. Writing to memory is faster. Well, I suppose you're right. It is. Um, well, there's already a, a, routine, a thing called memcopy intended to write to memory. It's. I don't know why you'd want to use print to write to memory, but anyway, for some reason you can. Okay. To make it faster, okay. Well, all right, good. 
Anyway, so that's the thing. Now, what it actually writes to that location is it writes the total number of characters you printed so far. So I think it must be to like put the length of something in a location in memory. But anyway, that's why what it writes is actually a small number, the total number of characters you printed so far. And so I can write to arbitrary M locations. So now I have two vulnerabilities. This is an information disclosure vulnerability, and this is a DOS vulnerability. I can crash the program and I can cause it to read some memory that I didn't have any business reading. So those are two kinds of vulnerability. But of course, the one you always want is remote code execution. That's when people will pay you the big bunny for bug bounties and everything. That means you can do anything. That's the most powerful kind of exploit. And that's what we want. So by the way, this same vulnerability applies to all these variations of printf. There's a bunch of different ways to print, print to a file, print to the console, print to a string, print to some other thing. There's a bunch of different printfs and they all use format strings the same way. So they all have the same vulnerabilities. So if you want to prevent this, by the way, good luck. All the defenses that protect the stack do absolutely nothing. Address space layout randomization does nothing. The same vulnerability applies to printf. It doesn't matter where you are. Non-executable stack does nothing. I'm not executing code. Um, so now static code analysis tools can find it. All you have to do is read the source code and look for a print with a format string and no variable or variable and no format string. That's not something you should be doing. It would actually be quite easy, even just a normal text editor. You could just search for that pattern. Um, so if you read your source code, it'd be pretty easy to catch, but for some reason it continues to be happening a lot. You would think, People just run it through a standard source code scanner like Lint and it would catch it. But in practice, that doesn't happen. Uh, it, I think it would catch it, but apparently a lot of people don't use it. Just like, you know, people complain about spelling in my projects. I don't run them through a spelling checker. It would be inconvenient for me, so I don't bother. I think there's a lot of developers that don't bother to run it through any scanner. That's what I'm guessing. Uh, and if you run it through GCC, you could make your compiler bounce it. If, I, if somebody was to ask me, I would make my compiler bounce things that don't have a format string. That would be reasonable. I would make that the default and you'd have to give it some switch to override that, but they haven't done that yet. It will just warn you, but it won't um, block it yet. So anyway, now you just have to know the technique to exploit it. You have the ability to write to random memory, to write to memory. Now you want to control that and take over the machine. So this is a useful instruction before with the stack buffer overflow, we were able to directly change the EIP. And we know how to take over the machine if we have that. Now we have a more complicated situation, we cannot control the EIP we can write to a memory location. You can still take over the machine, but there's a couple more steps. So here's what we're going to do. We have to find some place to write to, which will eventually get put in the EIP. So you could, for example, write to a value at the end of a stack frame. And then when the stack we were trying to go there, there are in fact handier places to do it, but that's the point. So once we can control, we can write an address to something that will eventually be used for the EIP and we put value we put in there, we'll point to shell code we've injected. And then we've got essentially the same thing as the stack buffer overflow. So we have to control a parameter. Now here's something that is a little bit mind bending. When I run this program, ED204, and then I give it a string, that has to go on the stack. It calls my program, it puts this on the stack. Now these percent X's are revealing data on the stack. Somewhere on that stack is this command and that argument. I can look at myself. This is a little mind bending, but that's the way it is. If I do this, if I go back to the percent X percent X one, okay, I'm seeing a bunch of values from the stack. Um, if I put some normal letters in here, like A, 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 they go on the stack. And you can see them there, 41, 41, 41, 41. They've got to be somewhere on the stack. Everything you put in is copied to the stack and then used by the program. So these A's are in fact on the stack somewhere. And for this simple program, they're the fourth word on the stack. So now I not only can see what's on the stack, I can control a value on the stack. If I put some four bytes here, I know those four bytes will be the fourth word on the stack. So now, as you can see, I can write to a targeted address. I put the address here backwards in hexadecimal, and then I put a percent n here, and it will write to that address as the fourth argument. So that's now that's not always the fourth argument. In some real code that was exploited this way, it was like the 230th argument. In a complicated program, it might have a bunch of other things on the stack that you have to punch through to get to it. But anything you put here has to be on the stack somewhere. So you'll find it if you go put out enough percent x's. So that's the game. All right. Um, so then all you have to do now is figure out where you want to write. And here's some places you could go. You could write to the saved return address at the end of a stack frame 
and that would work the same way we've done it before. But that would keep moving with the size of the stack and maybe be a little annoying to find. The global offset table is what we're going to do here. That's a nice general solution. The global offset table, um, whenever you call a C library function, you don't jump directly to the function. You jump through to a global offset table, which then points to the function. Um, it jumps through a couple of hops on the way there. And so that turns out to be a very handy place to put it. And we're going to use this same technique later when we do kernel exploits on Windows. Um, and then there's, there's also a destructors table, by the way. When programs exit, it calls destructors, and you could write to them. And there are C library hooks elsewhere in memory. But we're going to do the second one, the simplest one, the global offset table. So um, there's another one called the at exit structure, which is a thing that's called when a, when a program exits. In principle, you could do any of them or any function pointer. And by the way, in Windows, there's a unhandled exception handler that's easy to find and easy to exploit. So you can then cause an exception and it will call that, um, especially in earlier versions of Windows like Windows XP. That was an easy target to hit. Anyway, um, so if we take this thing apart, let me just disassemble it and let's take a look at how this program works. If I disassemble, uh, if I GDB ED204 and now I uh, disassemble main Okay, let me make my window a little bigger so it wraps around more nicely. I'm going to quit and run it again. Okay, so here we are. I'm reading I'm my program. This is setting up the prolog, setting up the stack frame. Then it calls um, printf here, where it prints something out. Now I'm just going to look at the functions. It calls, calls printf, and then it calls string copy, printf, put char, and then it exit down here. That's essentially what it does. So remember, it's just going to... Um, check up above to see if you put in the right number of parameters and quit. That was the other exit that went by. Down here, it's going to copy the command line argument into a local buffer, and then it's going to print it without a format string, and then it's going to print out a copy for me on the screen, and then it's going to exit. So all I really care about here is this. This is where the vulnerability is, at that printf. And here, it executes an exit. So if I was to hijack the exit routine, I could change the address of exit here, and when it tries to exit, it'll come back to where I told it to go. That's what I'm going to do. Um, one thing, I was doing a CTF a couple of years ago, and I had, you had to pump, you had to put this flag, so I got to find a format string vulnerability, and I overwrote the printf function, and then when I tried to print the flag, I'd overwritten it, and I trashed that function. It was very annoying. There wasn't a good function used after it that I could afford to destroy. But here I have a function I don't care about, exit, which I can afford to destroy. If I was to overwrite a function I need, then of course that function won't work anymore, unless I write my exploit more carefully. Anyway, so that's what's going on here. So all I have to do is um, go there. Now I have to find the location of a pointer which is used to perform an exit, and that's the global offset table, and you can get that with objdump minus r. And this is included by default in every version of Linux I know. Um, Object dump is very commonly used. You can get the disassemble from the code, and you, for the widest R, you get the relocation records. So this shows me the relocation records, and there aren't very many because this is very simple code. It only uses a few library calls. So every library call is here, and the only thing I care about is this one. So the exit library call jumps through this address, 0804A014. So if I write to that address, then whatever code tries to call exit, it will go to whatever I put in here. So I can now make an ex some exploits code. And um, let me go to my instruction. We're just following a project here, so let me bring it up. Because um, I didn't know any better way to do this than with just a demonstration. So I go to the projects and go to 204, which is here. OK. And so I've already loaded the program, done the source code, and all this jazz are about halfway through. OK. Now I want to write to that. And I'm just going to debug it again. And this stuff is kind of annoying to type, so I'm going to copy and paste it. So let's go back into the debugger, which is here. OK, and now I'm going to paste that. So what I've done here is I've examined one word at that address. So the current, locate, current value in that address is this number, 0804-8366. That points to the real exit routine. Now, if I run the program with this parameter, 0804-A014 backwards, and then percent %x, percent %x, percent %x, percent %n. The percent %n is going to refer to the fourth word on the stack, 
and the fourth word on the stack is going to be this number, 0804A014. So this is going to write into that location in memory. So when I do that, it writes, it prints out the contents of the stack here, and then it comes back, and it gives me a segmentation fault because it found a 1B there. And I could put a breakpoint in my program. If I disassemble main, um, I could go down here and find, I think this is it, the printf. That might be another one. Yeah, this is the printf. So let's put a breakpoint after this, but before it leaves. So I have main plus 115. Let's put break main plus 115. Okay. And now I'm going to run. Um, let's run the program again. Like this. And I'm going to put a break before that at one main plus um, 110 also. So I break before and after. Come on, where's my bird is? Bear, main plus 110 there. So I'm going to break before the overflow and after the overflow. So now I'm going to run with that special value in my parameter, which is someplace in my up arrow list. All right, I'm going to have to copy it again. Somehow I've lost it. Uh, all right. All right. Let's run the program here. If I make my computer work, okay. There, I'm gonna start it over again. Now I wanna examine that memory before I do the overflow, which would be in my up arrow list, there we are. So right now it contains 0804, which points to real executable code. That is something that will eventually actually run the real library code. Now when I continue, it's going to perform the print operation, which is going to cause the format string to write to that location. So if I look at it now, that contains this number, 0000001B. That's a real small number, like around 30, because that's the number of characters I printed so far. That is this long string I had when I ran it. Uh, backslash X14A004, that whole mess is, is this many characters long. That's what this 1B is. So I've taken this number, which ought to be 0804 and something, and made it almost zero. So that's why it crashes when I continue. It's gonna call exit, and it's gonna to try to run code at that location, and that is, of course, an invalid location, because we talked about this before. If I do info proc map, it shows me the available locations, and that's not one of them. I'm not allowed to use 0000 right at the bottom. The lowest address I'm allowed to use is 0804, and then a range up here in the Fs. Zero, zero, something starting with six zeros is not a valid memory location for this program to use, that's why it crashes. So, I can now, that's how my DOS actually works. So, this means we control the EIP. I'm able to put a value in here, and that value eventually goes to the EIP. So, I've now crashed the machine. Now, I just need to put a better value there. So, um, let's put it in Python. And um, let me go to my instructions here. All right, so here's the Python code. This will write four bytes. So let's try this one and yeah. uh, quit here. In fact, I think all I'm gonna do is just make a second window to my machine. That's what worked pretty well last time. Let's make a second SSH window. All right. Okay. And now go into the same directory. Okay, and now, okay, nano attack one, and put in my code. Okay, so what this is gonna do is it's going to write um, to location 0804A014, and then to 15, 16, and 17, writing one byte. And every time it's gonna write 32 bits, which is going to be three bytes of zero, and the last byte will be a small number like 1V. Then it's going to move one up and do it again and again, so it's going to carefully write the bytes one by one. We'll see what this does. Um, so that will, so I save this, so I can get my computer to work. Okay, and then Python, att1 to um, exploit1, and now in my GDB, which should be um, over here, okay, I can run, There, and instead of running from that, I'm gonna run from uh, EX1. Let's see what that does. Now I still have the breakpoints in here, which is not bad. So 
it ran, exited normally. Well, I'm losing my mind. Was it EX1? It was EX1. Um, all right. Um, all right. I don't know what's going on. I'm going to quit and come back. It should have at least had breakpoints. So what happened here? Um, let's run it again. Now run from that file. It exits normally and doesn't crash, so I am very confused. Let's see what's in EX1. Um, all right, let me go back to my instructions. I do not know what happened there. That should have crashed and something weird is going on. Let's go back to here and see what I did wrong. I've got instructions, so I'll stick to them. Um, okay, I did it this way. I guess I'll run it that way instead of trying to pull it from a text file, which for some reason failed. Let me try that. Um, so let's run from dollars. Uh, oh, I need to make it executable then. All right, let's if I can get to my other window somehow. You need um, admin, you need admin. There, all right. So let me um, shamode plus X, attack one. Okay, and then run attack one and see how it looks. Okay, it prints out this junk and funny characters, which is what I want. All right. And so now if I go to here, I should be able to run this thing, attack one. All right, let's see what that does. Okay, now it crashes. Now I feel better. Now I don't know why I couldn't put it in a text file and take the input from the text file. Oh, I do know why. Because it's a command line argument. The command line argument, you can't put it in with the less than sign. That would be if it was asking a question. For the command line argument, you have to do it with this construction where you use the dollars parentheses around the executable and that means you run it and then put that right in the command line. Okay. So anyway, that's the correct syntax to put it in here. So now it crashes, and here's what ended up in there, 3730F, 4740F. So that is going up by eight bytes each time because it's the number of bytes printed so far. And after each one, it moves up one byte and does it again. So the first time it wrote 00037, the next time it wrote 000, um 3F, and the next time 0047, and 0004F. So with four write operations, I was able to write a 32-bit word, and I did some collateral damage. The three bytes after this got overwritten to garbage. But I am able to put the, all four bytes in here. Now, I'm still putting invalid bytes in there, and it causes the program to crash. So I need a slightly more complicated version of this to control it. And that's what I have here. So I put in AABBCCDD, I have to roll it over. Remember, I've got a 32-bit word, and I'm going to use only the eight bits on the right. So if I wanted to write, say, a small number there, like 01, I'd have to add 256, and then the byte I want, and then take away the value it had in the first place. So I have to do this math on each one to have more and more multiples of 256, so that the last eight bits turn into the desired value. So now I can hit exactly this stuff, A, A, B, B, C, C, D, D, with that one. And uh, it took me a while to get as good as I am, which, as you can see, is not all that good at doing this. But um, anyway, this is uh, going to be attack two. And it's going to have that junk in it. OK. I've got to make it executable. OK. And now if I run that one which I had right there, attack two, come on, okay. All right, now it's gonna start and run and crash, and now it has AABBCCDD. So now I totally control all four of those bytes. So now I can put any value I want in there, and I just need to choose what to put in there. So now if I've essentially gotten to where we would have been before with a buffer strain exploit, I now control the EIP. The process of getting there is a little screwy, but now I control the EIP, so I can put in, for example, a NOP sled and then dummy shell code, which is CCs, which is breaks, because this is a way to test to make sure I really have code execution. So let's do this one. This is nano attack three. Oops. Okay. So all I've done is the same thing. I write the four bytes. And then here, I write in 100 NOPs and then 250 CCs. That's what I'm using for shell code. So that's what, and since I'm just putting it in the print statement, that will be on the stack somewhere. So I'm going to be attempting to execute code on the stack, and I want to see if that works. So I go back to my debugger, and I run this on attack three. 
And I want to put a breakpoint in before I do that because um, I don't want to just let it crash. I want to examine the situation. So I'm going to disassemble main. Okay. And I'm going to find the location of the exploit, which is here. And it performs the attack here and changes the value of exit, and it doesn't use it until exit. So breaking at main plus 115 will do to see the, the, what I've done to memory. So break main plus 115. Okay, so now I'm going to run using attack four. Or is it attack three? It's attack three. All right. All right. And so it's going to run and hit the breakpoint. Wait, permission denied. Oh, I forgot to make it executable. All right, let's try that again. So I run it. Okay, now it hit the breakpoint, breakpoint one. It printed out a bunch of junk, including non-printable characters that made it scroll. And now I can examine memory. So let's um, info uh, registers, for example, to see what we've got. The stack goes from 0A0 to 4B8. So I can X slash 400X. ESP. The end of the stack is at 4B8 in case I care, but I don't really care this time because I'm not trying to overwrite the end of the stack. I just want to see what's in the stack. So I need my window to be wider. I'm going to run it again. All right. And you can see here, here's my NOP sled. Here's my dummy exploit. So it's sitting there in memory. Remember, I could now write any address I want. And the address I want is just like before. I should just pick a value in my NOP sled. So this will do. That's an acceptable target value. So to gain control of the box, I want to put that in the pointer to exit. So let me get to my other window somehow. OK. And let's make uh, nano. Um, let's copy attack 3 to attack 4. And nano attack 4. And remember, there's these four bytes here are what I write. So I'm going to put here, that's my target. I want to go to that address, FFFFD120. So it's going to be, um, was it ABCD from the right? I think it was. I think it's this way. This is either this or it's backwards. 20 D1, FF, FF. There, let's try that. If I've done it right, that will now go up and run through my NOP sled and actually hit my brakes. Let's see if that works. That's ATD4, I need to show mod. Well, I don't need to because I copied it and that will have copied the permissions. So I can quit doing this. Okay, I can run it again with attack four. Okay, now it's gonna start and run and hit the breakpoint. Now I can examine a few things here. If I examine that memory address, it should be up here someplace. X1X, I guess not. Okay, I gotta copy it from my instructions. Um, that memory address is here. Let's see what it put in that memory address. It put FFFFD120, and now if I examine the stack, 100x is probably enough. Um, FFFFD120 is here, so it is hitting my knobs. So if I continue, it will reach the end of the program, try to exit, and exit will in fact go here. It'll slide down these knobs and break when it hits the seeds. So let's see what happens when I continue. Continue. And that's what it does. It made it through to the breakpoint trap at this location, D155. So it did slide down the sled until it hit this byte and then stopped. So I know I can execute the code I put in there because it executed the knobs. Now all I have to do is put shell code here and I've got the box. And that is the same thing we've done before. So I don't think I need to go through it. Um, we've, we've done this before. All you have to do is make some shell code and you can just make it with that. If you've done before. So once you, oh, one thing to mention though is you should test it right here. So let's talk about that. Now we know we're using a command line argument. We have the name of the program and then a space in the command line argument. And in fact, there are other things that separate arguments, like carriage returns, line tabs, any of those we know cannot be used because they will cause it to break the argument into two arguments or terminate the string. So those are characters we have to avoid. And there might be other. So here's a program to test all the others. 
14 so let me just run this one because it it's, uh, it's a process you always have to go through to check for the for lunch. You see cargo is this way. I don't know. Or maybe it's down. I don't know. Yeah. And put in this so stuff. It shows in, uh, and let me see what this positive, chat message shows says. Up red, so you see this, you know, this. Oh, thank you for telling me. I, I should be mute everybody. Good. Oh, I, guess. I probably don't have my sound on or something or I would have known. Thank you for telling me. All right. Yeah, I can mute them all from here if I remember. Anyway, so here's the... Um, so what I've done here is instead of, I have exactly the same stuff we had before, except instead of shell code, I've just put in all 256 possible bytes, except for 9, 10, 13, 32. If it's not in those, then put it in here. So it's going to put all the bytes in order. And the only point of this is I want to see if they all make it into memory. If any of those bytes are bad bytes, they will terminate the string and it will not end up in memory. So we run this one. That is bad.py. Make it executable. Bad.py. Okay, now I go here, and this is all set up to go. All I have to do is run the program and feed it data from bad.py. All right, so I run it. It hits the breakpoint. Now I just need to look in the memory, which is x100x ESP, and I find my NOP sled here, and down here I'll have all the bytes in order. So here they go. It starts here with 0, 1. Then two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It skips nine because nine is a tab or something bad, and A is something bad. Then it gets down to 10. It goes down here in 18, 19, 1A, 1F, 21. It skips 20 because 20 is space, and space is bad. And from now, it doesn't, it tries all possible strings. So now you'll see a nice pattern 21, 31, 41, 51, 61, making it up to B1. And if I load another page of it, C1, D1, E1, and I just didn't go far enough. Let me put 120X here. Okay, there. And so it's D1, E1, F1, and up here to F, E, and FF. So all the bytes right up to 255 made it. If any of them had been bad, like a space or a tab, this sequence of bytes would have stopped. So I know I can use all the characters except four. So when I generate my shell code, I have to use the MSF Venom command to dodge those. And here's the one that does it. You use, you choose the exploit you want. I'm used to shell bind TCP. It'll just start listening on port 4444. Yes, I'll just keep going. And here's the bad bytes, which is one, two, three, four, the five I knew about. And then I just want it in Python. And this prepend fork equals true. You have to play with those options sometimes to make it run. I don't really understand them in any great detail. That's exactly how it implements the new process. And I've just found that when my exploits fail, I often turn on a couple of those advanced options to make it work. It would be a good thing one day to actually, you know, research it and get a complete understanding of why sometimes it works and sometimes the other works, but I haven't bothered. So I guess I'll finish it here. If I do that, that should create exploit code to use. And I should be able to copy my attack for, to, okay, so there's my exploit code. So I'm going to, um, you know, I think they're writing this in Python 3 now. Just is not looking the way it used to. I wonder if that's going to work in Python 2. Because, you know, Python 2 is coming to the end of life. Anyway, so let's do um, copy attack 3, 4, to attack 5. And make sure I've got it. Okay, so nano attack 5. All right, and I have to paste that junk in. Here I had my shell code was cc times 250. And instead, I'm going to use that stuff, which is buff. And now I want to um, make my shell code equals buff plus 250 minus the length of buff. Times a. Here, that, I just I need to keep the total length the same because otherwise the length, the size of the stack will move. So this will give me, instead of being 250 cc's, I'm just gonna have this buffer that came from Metasploit and then enough junk to fill it back up to a total length of 250. So if I've done it correctly, this will be better shell code to run. So that's attack five. And I don't need to make it executable because I copied an executable file to get my starting point. So I should be able to run attack five and it should run and hit the breakpoint, and now I should be able to examine the value I've loaded into memory. 
up here. There it is. Okay, and that is FFFFG120. And if I examine the stack, I should find that there. D120. Uh, let me slide this to the left to be a little less confusing. D120 is here, so that hits the NOP sled. So it goes through the NOPs. Then this is the Metasploit shellcode, which is fine. And here's the A's that come after it. So I know it's all got there. If I had a bad character, the Metasploit shell code would terminate and the A's wouldn't have got there. That's why I put something I can recognize there. So this should be fine. If I continue, this should work. In practice, how do you know? Because obviously when you put A's in your, in your codes, how would you know that your code went through? Oh, I know it went through because if it, if it had a bad character, it would terminate the input and wow. none, of the, none of the stuff beyond that would go through. So when the A's get through, I know everything before it went through. That's why you, that's why, that's why I have the hat with 4141. You get used to making, inputting something you can recognize by tradition, capital A's. Then it's easy to tell whether you made it, whether that actually entered the memory. So if I continue, it runs and it doesn't crash. It exits normally. So this should mean that I, my box is now listening on port 4444. So let's try this other window and do a pseudo SS minus pant, which is the modern replacement for netstat. And it should show me listening on a port. And it does. There we are. I'm listening on port 4444. So this box is now uh, listening and everyone can get a shell. So I can check that. I can connect to it. It is local host on 4444. And when I do, I'm in and I can do who am I and LS and so on, and I have no prompt, but this is what you're used to with a Metasploit listening shell. You don't get the prompt, you don't really have a bash shell, but you have some kind of shell. I think it's actually a Z shell or something, is the default shell. But anyway, I now have control of the box. So I can exit from the remote control shell, and then I'm back to this one. So that's the whole thing where you take over the box with a format string. And hopefully you can see most of it is the same thing we did with the buffer overflow, which is gonna be true of all exploits, all of them have the same general property. You're trying to put your egg in there. You're trying to run your egg. You just have to find some hole you can use to gain control of the EIP to run your egg. And there's, so this is just the latest trick, this crazy format string. This really happens a lot. And so there's a variety of flags to find and so on here. So that's just one for this one. But anyway, that's what I wanted to show you. That's the joy of format strings. Are there any questions? Let me go back to my slides and see if there's anything else to mention here. Uh, we talked about defenses for what they're worth. Um, we've done all this. Check for bad characters. That's a big thing. You have to keep the total length of what you put in constant. I mentioned that before. You're probably tired of hearing it, but I, you always have to put the same length every time or you will go mad. I made that mistake enough to remember not to do that anymore. <laughs> and um, so you end up with a shell. So I have some cahoots. And let's take a look at them. In one of my other windows, I have cahoots. Okay. It is 127 chapter four, which is here. Okay. And let's see. All right. There we are. And it should be playing some music or something. Let's see. Um, sound. There we are. Okay, good. All right, there comes some people, and I should have a place to put the scores, and I do. Okay, life is good. few more. I'll wait a few more seconds. Oh yeah, here come some people. Good. All right, another five seconds and then we'll go with this many. Aha, okay. I'll wait a bit, see if any more are coming. All right, I'm thinking this is it. Okay.
So what does a percent D mean? That's a decimal number. That's how you print an ordinary counting number. How about percent N? Okay, that's the one that writes to that location in RAM that is so useful to an attacker and of unclear value to anyone else. How about percent P? It's a pointer, very similar to percent X. Just prints out a value in hexadecimal. All right. So what defense will stop format strings? Yep, the only thing that will do you any good is code review, as far as I know. None of these defenses will stop it. They'll stop stack overflows, but they will not stop format string attacks, which is pretty weird. All right. So which one of these is used when the program exits? Yeah, now it might call, what I did was I used the global offset table because I explicitly called exit. But if you just end your program and don't call exit, then it will still call the destructors. At the end of every program, that's part of the process it does to return back to the operating system is destroy all the objects you've created. So this is a place you could put uh, an address that would be used, and then you would not have to stomp any C library code. All right. So here's some Anton. Looks like a real name. And so does Ken Tan. Let's spell this better, though. But uh, I'm you're Mr. Obato? Okay. Ed, right? Good. Okay. Good, good, and I actually have real names and we're in good shape. So anyway, um, let's take a look at the schedule. So we've, we've been through format strings. Next week we have a guest speaker. This is a guy I know from Florida. He is now uh, in charge of cryptography for WordPress, I think. So he's really quite an expert in cryptography and he'll talk to us about whatever he's up to. Um, so I'm glad to have him. And I got no quiz or project due. We'll have this. And if anybody from another class wants to come or do this one, you get extra credit for watching the guest speaker. I do that for all of them. You put a list, you can put your name on it. So uh, check that out if you like. And in fact, I have a lot of guests coming um, beyond that one. Ming is coming on Monday next week um, to this class. And Scott then, and then Chris Gastardi after that, quite a few guests. So these are all worth extra credit if you go to them, and uh, they may or may not be recorded. I, I think these guys have all agreed to have it streamed, but maybe not recorded. I know the Uber guest that I had a week ago was wonderful, but he did not want that stuff posted publicly. So if you want to see the video, you have to contact me and give you a private link to it. But um, anyway, it was very interesting. These guest speakers bring in a lot of useful information. So I encourage you to show up physically. It's probably the best way to get the most out of it, although uh, they will be zooming in. So connecting over through Zoom should probably be about as good for most of these guys that are, these try, no, we're both zooming in because you're not local. Um, him, I think, is coming physically, but I'm not sure. Anyway, any questions about anything? Well, then I'm going to stop the share, and I'll stick around in this lab for a while if anybody wants to do any work here. Um,